Hi, I'm Jessica. I'm a political scientist and spiritual advisor. And today's philosophy lesson is going to be about a Japanese concept called Ikigai. And this is to help you find your purpose in life, your reason for being. And we're going to get, oh, I'm going to get a little bit personal talking about some of my career choices, where I'm going next with my career and spilling the tea on why the crystal shop closed, so stay tuned. Thank you for being here, and I just want to let you know that you are loved, and I wish you many blessings, and I hope you're having a fantastic day today. As promised today, we're going to be discussing the concept of Ikigai, which translates from Japanese to a reason for being. And this is a way to find your sense of purpose, a reason for living and your career, life overall. Let's get into it. Most people, when they are just discussing Ikigai overall, or trying to introduce the concept, you will come to a Venn diagram like this. And this can be a little bit overwhelming when you're just looking at it. Um, mostly, this is, this actual one is a little bit elaborate with the words on the outside that's added by the artist, which is credited below. But I find when I'm working with clients, trying to help them sort through things and find new career paths and everything, this is difficult for them to answer because they've been, you know, they've had anxiety, they've had other people's ideas and manipulations in their head. So when it comes to answering something as basic as what do you love, that can be a difficult kind of question to ask and same thing with the other ones on here so i'm gonna break them down and also give a couple examples of how this can be used beyond a venn diagram and we'll have some quotes in here later let's start out with the 2024 presidential candidate kamala harris i love venn diagrams <laughs> i really do i love so we will look at this here again in a moment, but let's go through ways that you can help an or actually answer these questions and kind of do a little bit of self-discovery beyond this chart. First thing we're going to look at, we're going to start from the top and go clockwise. What is something you have always loved? Now, this is phrased such a way because a lot of times we have to go back to things that feel natural to us from our childhood a lot of times because before we start getting hang-ups about the world, we do have a free nature about us a lot of times as children and we find that there's certain things we're inclined to do certain things that we are excited to do so that's why starting this question from that basis and that deep self-discovery you can eventually kind of narrow it down on what you love to do okay second thing we're going to look at is what need can you fulfill in your world? Now, a lot of times with just Ikigai, it says, what does the world need? Well, the world needs a little grace, compassion, non-judgment, all those things. But when we look around in our own world, when we have a deeper understanding and compassion and we're listening to those around us, we can really start to answer this question for ourselves. How about let's start using an example. If we go back to the first question, let's say as a child, you loved watching baking shows. You were fascinated with 
all of the measurements and following directions and the product it created. I don't know. I'm not a baker per se. So whatever it was that you loved about it, as in like the people that you're baking with as a child, different things like that, it's going to be different. Now, if we go back to our example of a baker, obviously there is going to be people that always need bread and need food, but we can look around and see, okay, they need to eat. And if they're getting those needs fulfilled in their own home, when they're making their own bread, why would they need you? So then it starts getting you to ask deeper questions about what is it that I can provide that other people need? It's just another way to look at it. Maybe your bread has special designs in it or really good ingredients. Okay, so traditionally this part, this circle in Venn the Venn diagram is represented with what can you get paid for? But I've modernized this question because there are certain jobs and things that you could never imagine in past years being able to make money at at all. Look at this, what I'm doing right now on the internet. If people stopped themselves from dreaming ways to make money and things like that, then we wouldn't have new professions and we wouldn't have any of the modern ways to make money. Perhaps you get what I mean. What is something you know you can become good at or a current skill you have? Now, a lot of times with Ikigai, this is phrased as, what is something you're good at? And that implies a natural talent of some sort. There is something to be said for, you know, I'm 5'3", I'm obviously not going to go to the NBA, but... There are other things that I can become good at, and there are things that I have already perfected. So you want to look at this question holistically as well. And <sighs> what good is it? And is there a way to really get into answer these questions? Uh... Let's roll it back a little bit. Now, back to what I was describing with talent a moment ago. There is a difference between potential and gained talent. So, I love this quote from Conor McGregor, the notorious one. And what he's describing is he has, you know, obviously it started from a place of fitness and capability. So that is what's natural to him. So what I mean by inspiration and, and everything like that is that recognizing of that talent within you. So I want to read the quote for anyone just listen to audio. There's no talent here. This is hard work. This is an obsession. Talent does not exist. We are all equals as human beings. You could be anyone if you put in the time. You will reach the top. And that's that. I'm not talented. I am obsessed. Conor McGregor. All right, let's talk a little bit more about answering these questions and how, and I want to go over this because a lot of times people hold themselves back. And a great example of an, I like using the example of athletes with this because especially with individual sports like hand-to-hand -hand combat or this example here with running, it's all about are you beating yourself in a lot of ways? What's your last um, best time or best performance? And then if you start competing with yourself in the gym, per se, when you get out to the ring and such, it will not reflect anybody's work you know, your coaches or your nutrition or anything else that's down to you on display, your talents on display on the field or the octagon. 
rant over. Okay. Roger Bannister was the first man to run a four minute mile. Now this is a big deal because for a long time, everyone have thought that it was impossible or, or it was just not entered into the reality of what was possible for running. So when Roger Bannister put his mind to it, um, he later went on to become a neuroscientist. Amazing story that I looked into for this one slide for you. When Roger Bannister broke that record and ran the four minute mile, it actually put the idea in lots of other runners mind of what was possible because he visualized it. It became part of external reality for everyone. It has been accomplished several more times since he did this. Now, let's look at a couple examples of how we can really fill out this icky guy Venn diagram. Venn diagrams with uh, practicality in mind here. So like we kind of discussed talent versus capabilities, I must, must advise you to be very honest with yourself as far as what you are, not in a harsh way, but in a positive way. Because people have may have told you before you're not capable of doing something. They maybe told you what you're talented at, or they told you you were shy, or they told you you were outgoing without you listening to yourself. So when you're doing this icky guy diagram, you're trying to answer these questions. It is only to your benefit for you to be brutally honest in a positive and practical could be construed as negative way. Okay. When you're also putting together this, filling out these questions for Icky Guy, trying to make sense of it all, don't limit yourself with how you're dreaming your new career and the different possibilities from answering these questions. Because we have to not look at, okay, we can't run a four minute mile, can't be done, but it's more like if I put in this work, I do this thing. If I, back to our example of baking that fell off, if, if I start um, my career as a baker, is it probable I'm going to go learn this? Is it probable that I am going to make the investment to buy good equipment or pans or whichever it is or decorating supplies. Next, let's look at what is possible as far as our current situation and how we can actually enhance those um, what is possible from the skills that we can acquire from and, and also the possibilities that we open to ourselves when we are looking for what is right for us and the direction we want to go. So let's also not forget that when we are just dreaming of this and we're answering all these questions and putting it together, there has to be a way that you can put it into practice. All right. And with all that being said, don't forget to dream big when you are filling out these different questions for yourself and trying to discover your icky guy, don't limit yourself. It's to your benefit that I say that. Now, let's take a look at this again. Now that we've kind of discussed possibilities, go ahead and you can pause it here if you want, and then we will get to part two of this. All right, so hopefully you enjoyed my little presentation there on Icky Guy. And I've let's get started on spilling the tea. Just kidding. It's not that dramatic. But I do want to show Case and just tell you a little bit about how I've used Icky Guy in my life by just explaining some of that to you. Now, I, if you're new here, I'll 
go ahead and fill you in a little bit. I had a school of philosophy and crystal shop up until a couple months ago. And there was a lot of speculation, obviously, small town business closing, which not really these days with this economy. However, I do have my own personal reasons and it had nothing to do with being chased out of town or dramas, plural. <laughs> no, um, I couldn't justify ethically that people were having to make decisions between food and coming to my philosophy classes or buying crystals. It was just once I found out, or you know, you hear once or twice that people are making those kinds of decisions. And, you know, you hear about them because they come into the store to tell you. Or some people were even just dropping in to say, I love hanging out with you, Jessica, and I, the crystal shop fulfills me, but I just can't afford <laughs> to spend anything because I spent most of my gas money getting here. So <laughs> there's a big controversy. Not really one at all. It's just a matter of economics right now. So let me share a little bit about what can come about if you put Ikigai in practice other than the banking examples I gave. Okay. So the first thing but I asked myself, obviously, like I said, we'll start at the top again. What is it I love? Now, Ikigai, along with any other applied philosophies or anything like that, can go as big or as small as you want. So in this, in this instance, yes, I used it to help with career, but also... It's me. It's a philosophy teacher. It's someone who thinks too much. So... <laughs> What I did was apply it to bigger overall concepts and of stalling. Okay, what do I love? I love helping people. This is so exciting to me. This is what I like to do. I like to help people. And that's just kind of ingrained into me no matter what I'm doing or where I'm going. It's just how my natural state of being. So next thing is... What does the world need? And I kind of answered if you were paying attention earlier in the video when I said we need a little more grace, compassion, and uh, we judge each other so much. So working on that basis, I try to figure out ways that I can personally fulfill that need. You know, no pressure, call order, nothing like that. Okay, so... <laughs> What can I get paid for? Or, as if you recall, what can we monetize? And so far, most of my monetization, if I had to boil it down, as in strip away this, that, or the other of what I'm doing, it's entertainment. That's what I can monetize. I'm entertaining to you. Um, and finally... What am I good at? What are my traits? What can I do? And I have to keep going back to teaching. Teaching and music, but mostly just teaching. So, by this conclusion, before, I did arrive at the School of Philosophy in the Crystal Shop. So, there's that. And now that I'm looking at it again... And I will look at it again and again, probably many times throughout my life, because, you know, constant growth is the way to be, according to me. And now I'm looking at it and saying, so once the store closed down and I had to go back to the drawing board, there was um, a lot of people that immediately, when I said, oh, I'm shutting the store down, were like, oh, no. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? <laughs> Where will you go? What, how will you work? Huh? And many of them, I reminded them that I was doing this many years professionally without a home. 
for one to, you know, get them to calm down. And um, I never doubted for a second that I couldn't figure out what I was supposed to do. But let's circle back and go to Mickey Guy again. So, like I said, a lot of times the the way to answer what do I love uh, does go back to childhood, but not always. What I did was go back to an idea that I'd put on the back burner because several reasons, not even important. It was something that I thought impossible. It was something that I embodied as an impossible thing. And it was to create a TV show (laughs) of all things, right? Um, I didn't really do YouTube at the time. I didn't have Um, you know, of like over 200 videos just because I, I just like to do this, but (laughs) the the whole dream of it really did seem impossible the way that I envisioned it, the way that I saw it. And I'm one of those people that I'm a, I don't like to say dreamer. I like to say visionary because I could see the entire thing just played out and I saw it played out perfect, but I thought it couldn't be accomplished because I didn't currently have the skill for it. So what I went back to with what I love is that idea of sharing those other things that I said that I love. (laughs) I could share that love in a TV show. So for question number two, what does the world need? What does my world need? What need would a TV show provide? And that's when I really started into that um, the details that I was saying you can modify what you're doing depending on where your little niche can fit in. And for my particular show, I don't want to tell all the ideas but it is going to be very exciting and also have a way to get other people involved. If you're excited, I'm going to be having some auditions soon. It's going to be great. So number three, monetization. How can we do this? So there is a lot of red tape and contracts and everything when you're going with any network, when you're trying to get um, funded for things, then it's also a matter of who's your boss, who are you answering to, uh, what are you willing to say, and save this and replay it back if I ever sell out, which I won't. I won't get paid to say something I don't believe. That's why I want to try to stay independent. I'm going to do a GoFundMe or there's another thing that I heard about called uh, Seed and Spark crowdfunding. I'll tell you how I learned about that in just a second. It's so exciting. So <laughs> the way that we're going to monetize this is by letting people decide if this is entertainment, if this is valuable by creating a pilot. So I'll be getting the pilot out and then promoting the out of it, sending it out everywhere. And if it's a good product, if it's a valuable product, what I always believe, and it's always proven to be true for me, is cream rises to the top. If it's a good product, then hopefully people will support it. And hopefully by then, Trump's back in office and we will have money in our pockets again. Number four, what am I good at when it comes to TV shows? What do I have to offer there? What skills have I acquired? Well, I started helping out on a TV show and turns out I love the production aspect of things. I like hosting too, like presenting like I'm doing now. And I enjoy the editing process if you're been watching most of this way through. I love the production aspect of it and just getting a chance to showcase my artistic vision through a visual medium 
and I'm becoming better and better at it every single time that I get in front of the camera, every single time that I'm editing, I am showing myself and putting into practice what I was saying um, as far as uh, like Conor McGregor did with talent and obsession and things like that. Every time I'm doing this, I get a little bit more knowledge from it and it's all going to be so beneficial when I do complete the project I'm wanting to do by creating this TV show. Again, let's revisit this because it definitely applies with what I'm talking about. There's no talent here. This is hard work. This is an obsession. Talent does not exist. We're all equals as human beings. You could be anyone if you put in the time. You will reach the top and that's that. I'm not talented. I am obsessed. This really resonates with me because most things that I find myself excelling at have been born from an obsession to get an art out, to create an art project, not an ego project, just to share that. And that's why I'm glad it is a Venn diagram. Venn diagrams. <laughs> because it isn't a bullet format and it isn't a numbered format because all these things have to work in tandem. I was able to acquire the skills by working hard, putting the action in, and I was able to meet the right people and the right opportunities because what I sought out and what I, I would look up a uh, law of assumption if you're not familiar with this, but basically I lived as if that was my destiny and the actions that I took in between there were aligned with that. And that's how I end up meeting the right people and opportunities and things like that to get information like how I got with the seed and spark and also uh, some other reference things. And <laughs> the way that happened is I was making part one of this. I was in the middle of creating it. And um, like any other human, I'm not impervious to the doubter inside of me and <laughs> I started wondering is this silly and then I got a phone call from a producer and I said and it was about something totally different and I said do you know what I've got an idea for a tv show for the flag network and it's gonna be hilarious because it's a comedy and we're gonna make their first episode the pilot is going to be about ADHD as if we don't get it done first. It'll never get done. So <laughs> it is going to be a riot. Um, thank you for sticking with me through this. And I love you. And I hope you have a great day. Many blessings to you. And hope to see you again soon. I really do. I love Venn diagrams. It's just something about those three circles and the analysis about where there is the intersection, right? Yeah, I see people that you agree with me, right? So, okay, so I asked my team, I, I brought